Welcome everyone to our session at the Global Landscape Forum on the Triple Challenge, One Health and the Greater Virunga Landscape. My name is Gary Tabor and I'm the president of the Center for Large Landscape Conservation in Bozeman, Montana and chair of IUCN's World Commission on Protected Areas Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group. Let me tell you a little bit more about our session today. We have two broad objectives. First, to share and reflect on how we can collectively respond to the triple challenge of providing food, dealing with climate, and protecting biodiversity. And what to do that we are going, and, and how to do this, and we're going to hear from World Wildlife Fund about a new report they have just published today. Second, we're going to discuss what this means at a landscape level, the triple challenge, through the case of the greater Virunga landscape in Africa. We will do this through what promises to be a fascinating panel discussion opened by a scene setting presentation. There will be four opportunities for you to be interactive part of this discussion. In a moment, we will launch a Slido poll. Then we will conduct a Slido poll after the Triple Challenge initial presentation. And then after that, thirdly, we will solicit your questions for our exciting panel discussion. And at the end, we will ask you all for your final reflections. So please, we want you to be participants and we want your thinking caps on. So let's begin. We'd like to find out a bit more um, about our audience as our first interactive session with a Slido poll. So we're gonna launch a Slido poll right now. And we're gonna ask you, um, and yes, so you access the Slido poll in two ways. One, you can take a photo of this uh, QR code right here on your screen. Or if you look in the chat box um, in Whova, you will see a link to the Slido poll itself. I'll give you some, a few moments to do this. So you will see that we've given you um, six choices um, to, see, to see what sector of this issue. There we are. So please vote. Do you predominantly associate with the biodiversity conservation community or the food and agricultural community, the climate change community, the human health or one health community or none or more than one? So let's get a sense of who we are. So get, let's give a few moments here. So we're talking today about why and how to take a cohesive approach to food, climate change, biodiversity, and even the health fields. So we'd like to know which sector, sector you best fit in, and hopefully we will successfully launch and get the answers to this poll in a second. Brilliant. Well, we couldn't be more evenly distributed as a community, could we? So this is your, you found your audience. Oh, now biodiversity is left ahead. More than one. So biodiversity and more, more than one, uh, our numbers are changing. This is like, a, this is gonna be election night in the United States in a week. Let's give a few more seconds here to the poll, see how things are going. Well, as you can see, from this snapshot in time, biodiversity conservation is the primar primary interest of this audience as a whole. Oh, I can't call this election, can I? So let's stop the poll now. And this, uh, so, I'm, so that I don't have to be a moderator like I will have to be uh, a, a, pro, a, a forecaster of, of people's feelings on this issue. But as you can see, biodiversity conservation and your interest in more than one of these sectors makes it right for your participation here. Because these, you know, this is not a clean 
um, world we live in in terms of this being just an environmental issue. This is a multi-sectoral issue. And today we're going to discuss that. And at this stage, I'd like to go hand this uh, presentation over to Will Baldwin Cantello, who is the chief advisor on forest at World Wildlife Fund UK and the lead author of this new report, The Triple Challenges, Synergies, Trade-offs, and Integrated Responses to Meet Our Climate, Food, and Biodiversity Goals. So Will, the session is all yours. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gary. And uh, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be presenting this report to you um, as a such a broad audience. Um, it's, it's produced as a WWF-led report, but of course it draws in expertise from a number of different experts, as you can see in this, um, in this slide, and we thank those experts for their input. It also draws on input from you all, because we launched a white paper on this subject at the June um, Global Landscape Forum con um, conference, and we held three sessions there on the Triple Challenge and, and gained a lot of insights, particularly on the food pillar of um, the Triple Challenge, and today we focus more on the biodiversity pillar. So we've gathered all that insight together and produced this more complete and, um, and uh, more detailed report on the Triple Challenge, which I'll summarize for you now. But first, let's get clearer on what the Triple Challenge is. And uh, in a nutshell, it, it's this. We, we've set ourselves three global goals as a global community on food, on climate change, and on biodiversity. And we need to meet those three goals simultaneously over the next 30 years. And in particular, the next decade will be critical in our success to achieve those. But it's also really evident that these three goals are completely interdependent, as is summarized in this um, diagram. And of course, as was mentioned by many of the sessions earlier today, achieving any one of these goals depends on achieving them all. We, we can't achieve um, any, any of them without all of them. Um, equally, the way we deliver on any of these goals also affects where, whether we can deliver on the others. So they're completely interdependent and we need to think about them as a package. And that is that heart of the triple challenge as we see it and, and um, the thinking that follows in this presentation. But of course, one of the other major concepts um, at this conference is One Health. And I'd like to explain a little bit about how I see, how we see the triple challenge connecting to One Health. And, one of the simplest ways to explain it is probably this. One Health is often described as thinking holistically about human health, about ecosystem health and animal health. And when you think about the pillars of the Triple Challenge, they relate very closely. Food and diets are obviously one of the cornerstones of our own health. Climate change is perhaps one of the greatest manifestations of um, the poor health of our global ecosystems. And biodiversity loss and animal health obviously go hand in hand as well. And if you think about COVID-19 in particular, WW, the, the responses to COVID-19 as a pandemic that WWF and many others have argued for relate very closely to the triple challenge as well around um, halting the conversion of ecosystems for agriculture, for example, and, and um, a different way of managing wildlife trade and building a resilient food system and of course, a green and clean recovery. The other thing I want to make clear before going further into uh, discussing the findings of our report is that we haven't produced any new science here. What we've done is synthesize science that uh, to date hasn't been connected well enough. Um, and we need to be thinking about our leading science on food and biodiversity and climate change in a joint way. And the, the research body that we have available to us does not sufficiently do that at the moment. We often find each pillar being treated in, in singular or perhaps in pairs. So we have tried to bring that together to advance our thinking. And when we do that, when we think about all of the science that we've produced and those particular global assessments from ITBES, from IPCC and others, there are a set of common responses that, that emerged and we highlight those as the six global responses that we think are most critical and, and the top priorities for delivering on the triple challenge. And those are each of these six actions you can hear, see here on screen have the potential to deliver across all three goals, but they also have the potential to reduce competition between the goals, which is really important because climate change, you know, dealing with climate change, halting and reversing biodiversity loss and producing nutritious food for our global population will require 
land and fresh water and marine resources. So we need to be thinking about that as well. And they all sit together as an integrated package, of course, and, and one allows the other. For example, our deep and rapid um, cuts in fossil fuel emissions, action one here, is really essential if we're going to minimize our dependence on carbon dioxide removal strategies, which um, might be uh, in particular the expansion of forest cover. And we've heard from another presentation earlier on how, um, how that carries potential biodiversity risks with it. Equally expanding um, protected areas and other um, uh, effective area-based conservation measures may require um, the use of land that has, uh, is currently used for food or might be planned for food in future. So it needs to sit alongside measures that um, improve the efficiency and the equity of our food system. So all of these, these six actions sit together collectively. But we also know um, that while it is possible, and it's been shown that it's possible to achieve these three goals globally, it will require those six actions and more, and it will also likely involve local and national trade-offs within the Triple Challenge. And we need to be honest about that, about the, the, the need to prioritize some actions over others in a given context, in a given national circumstance. And we summarize here some examples of um, the trade-offs that might occur depending on the response options we select, be that hydropower for clean energy or um, bioenergy crops for energy and so on. So we, we've thought about how those trade-offs might emerge and proposed three ways in which we can improve our handling of those trade-offs to find a fair, inclusive and evidence-based way through. One of those is integrated policy making. The second is what we've termed triple challenge dialogues which is really about how we bring people together to understand different trade-offs and the impacts on different parts of um, our, the, the community in question. And then the third is more integrated and um, politically relevant research, which underpins the first two actions. I'm, I'm not going to talk about all three of those now. I'm just going to focus on the first one around integrated policy. I'm going to, I'm going to do that because at the June session that I referred to earlier, we heard from you that this was the area that you thought had the most potential for delivering on the triple challenge. And so listening to that, we've decided to spend some energy and thought in finding out how we do that. And um, here are four steps, which are perhaps simplified for the purposes of uh, delivering this in, in the time we have available, but four sequential steps that lead to more integrated policy making or are essential for integrated policy making. It's worth saying that there is a limited amount of research on how you successfully deliver integrated policy making. And I think that reflects the fact that there are a few cases that have been successful. And I think we need to also be honest about the fact that we often need and call for integrated policy making, but very rarely has it been done successful, successfully. So we really need to put a lot of time and effort into making sure that this is possible and understanding how we can do it. So the four steps we have here is very clearly a, 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 a statement of intent and leadership from central government around the need for integration. The second is then reframing that policy issue in an interconnected way. And that's one of the objectives of the report that, that we've produced and the presentation I'm giving you now. Only then can you think about what institutional arrangements might be needed to both bring policy departments together, but also perhaps apply the scrutiny and the accountability that's needed to see that to deliver results. And then finally, then you can think about how do you change the policy instruments that exist in the food and the climate and the biodiversity spaces, or what new ones are needed. And this, I, I, I show this next section just to demonstrate that there is more detail in the report on how you might deliver on policy integration and allow you to, to dive into that report if that's where you want to find more information. The last thing I'll say is that, that often policy integration processes are started by some kind of shock. And we take the example of the Twin Towers attack in New York, for example, um, which led to a, a very strong emphasis on integrated policy making for homeland security objectives. But we might also ask the question, is COVID-19 a shock that we ought to use as a, as a wake up call for us as a global community to be thinking about these agendas more jointly? And with that in mind, I'm turning that lesson, those lessons on integrated policy making into the 2020 year of, um, of international policy and the global biodiversity framework as a particular example. We really have an unprecedented opportunity in 2021 
with coincidentally now because of the delays due to COVID-19, the food and the climate and the biodiversity summits arrive occurring within a few months. And in, in preparation for that, national governments will be submitting national statements and national commitments that ought to be developed as one package. So different, there's the three commitments that are made for each summit ought to sit together as one joint policy. And then we should be expecting the summits to be reflecting that integrated approach if we are to be getting back on course to delivering on the triple challenge. Unfortunately, at the moment, if you look at the draft biodiversity framework as one of the focuses of this conference, it does not do that enough. It, it does not call out climate change and the food system as um, the major drivers of biodiversity loss. And it does not integrate those into the targets um, and the indicators sufficiently enough. In fact, it only mentions climate change once in the whole document. Perhaps we could take one glimmer of hope from um, a new leaders pledge for nature, which was launched in September and now has over 70 signatories from heads of state or government. And it specifically calls for an integrated approach to these policy areas. And so we need to see this now both expand from 70 leaders to very many, to 200. And we also need to see that translated into the national preparations for these summits. I'm going to leave you with one final thought here. And it might seem, given the information I've talked about and that we have heard very much over the last few days, that the threats are very significant. The need to deliver on the triple challenge is very clear. It might feel like a daunting or negative agenda, but really what we're talking about is a positive agenda. We're trying to meet um, three global goals and we're trying to deliver a future where we all live in a healthy society with a stable climate and surrounded by a thriving nature. So I hope you will look up this report, read it, use it and share it. And um, with that, I'll, I'll hand back to Kerry. Fantastic presentation, Will, thank you so much. Please everyone read this report. I, I'm struck that a collective solution to the triple challenge goals are within reach. 2021 is a fantastic opportunity. I hope there are leaders in this audience who can champion this work and help us meet these integrated goals for all our sakes. Thank you so much, Will. So now um, we'd like to find a little bit more about you, our audience, and take uh, and, and find out what you took from the presentation. So we're going to launch another quick Slido exercise. Remember, you can take a shot of this uh, uh, QR code right here, or we'll have again uh, a link in the chat. And we're gonna ask you uh, for one question. Uh, what one word, let's see if we can bring it up now. What one word sums up the main takeaway thought or idea that you have from this presentation? So please enter that in and we'll see what kind of word cloud emerges over time. So again, what one word sums up the main takeaway or thought or idea you have from this presentation? Integrated policy. Integration. Trade-offs, challenge, synergy. This is cool. I'm sorry about the bias in English people. We'll continue for a few more moments here. Collaboration, time, interdependence, holistic, synergy.
So let's end the poll now if we can. And can we look at those results one more? Sorry, can we just go back and look at those results? But if not, let me just say, I, I saw the results being synergy challenge integration as being highlighted by your thoughts on this subject. But let me say this, all those words represent what one would say, this is an all hands on deck moment. We have to work together, we have to work across sectors and we have to work in new ways. The words and thoughts that you've presented here in this poll demonstrate that we all think that there's a new way forward that we have to save our planet. So we wanna thank you for thinking like that and thank Will and the authors of the Triple Challenge Report for putting this out there for us to do so. So now if you will, I'd like to segue into the next uh, portion of our session, which is how do we take this integrated approach to looking at these massive problems and apply it within the reality of a landscape context? So if you will, um, take a deep breath, because I want you to transition from um, the 30,000 foot thinking of, of these global goals. And I'd like to take you to a very, very special spot where people, places, and species are joined and interact in a landscape context. In Africa, along the iconic Western Rift Valley or Albertine Rift is the greater Virunga landscape, one of the great landscapes of the planet. A landscape so scenic, so biodiverse, and so productive for humanity that it is hard to capture in a few words, a region that divides the great Congo and Nile watershed and connects East and Central, Central Africa across the countries of Rwanda, Uganda, and Democratic Republic of Congo. It is a mountainous region where climate change looms large, and I've seen these impacts starkly. Having stood three times on the summit of Mount Stanley atop the Ruanzori Mountains, over three decades of my life, witnessing the dramatic receding glaciers of the fabled Mountains of the Moon, the future of the greater Virunga landscape is at a crossroads. And in this session, we discuss the triple challenge of conserving food security, safeguarding biodiversity, and addressing climate change in one large landscape. Three challenges that make for a One Health solution. So we are grateful now to have five practitioners beaming in from Africa. So excuse any kind of technical difficulties we may have because we are talking to people in some of the least accessible areas of the planet. Beginning with an overview presentation of David Dooley as country director for WWF Uganda, and then an interactive Q question and answer panel discussion with four of the region's conservation leaders. So I'd like to begin in the language of Western Uganda, Rutoro, I'd like to welcome David. Osaberiota, David, and we love to hear your presentation. I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Gary uh, Hururata. Uh, thank you for having me here, and uh, thank you for the good audi audience that I'm going to talk to. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about this great landscape uh, called the Greater Birunga Landscape. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Well, uh, on the slide there, we can see the map of Africa uh, on my left. And uh, uh, the green part is where the Greater Virunga is. It's lying uh, we live in, within the heart of Africa in three countries covering uh, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda. And on the right side, you can see the blown up map of the Greater Virunga landscape itself, uh, presenting to you an interconnected set of protected areas ranging from the north. Uh, we have uh, uh, the Kibale National Park, Simulik National Park, going to Rizori National Park, coming to Queen Elizabeth, going down to Virunga, and to Buindi and Gahinga and the volcanoes. Those are all sets of protected areas that are interconnected and providing a great uh, biodiverse place, one of the highest biodiverse place on earth with immense ecological 
and socioeconomic value for the area. Next slide. Uh, it's still the map, uh, but this time really reflecting the value of this landscape. Uh, it belongs to part of a bigger landscape called the Albertan Rift, and which contains the most uh, terrestrial diverse vertebrate species, more endemic vertebrate species than any site in the continental Africa. The landscape is also diverse with the ancient tropical forests uh, ranging from the deciduous to semi-deciduous and to the woodlands and to the tropical forests from lowland, medium, high altitude forests going to the alpine forest with the ice cap mountains in the Rinzori, there are six peaks there. All of them at one time had ice on them. Some of them are now receding and disappearing. We have active volcanoes uh, within the landscape and we have the savanna systems that represents the West and Central African system with the East African systems providing important habitat for the population of the African elephants including the forest elephants, the buffaloes, okapi, and it has the largest concentration of the hippo globally in one particular place. Interestingly, this is the only place on earth where you have the coexistence of 20 primate species existing, including the entire population of the remaining mountain gorilla population uh, in this zone, which has so far increased from 480 individuals more than 30 years ago to now 1,200, a specific and tremendous achievement in conservation. Because of this diversity, we have inter uh, uh, internationally recognized sites, including three World Heritage Sites, that is in the Vurunga, Ruizori, and, 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 and Buindi National Parks. And then we also have three Ramsar sites, including uh, the Virunga, the Ruinzori, and Lake George. And we have one man and Biosphere Reserve that is the Queen Elizabeth National Park. Now, the green area that you're seeing are very important areas called the key biodiversity areas. These are internationally recognized areas for persistence of the terrestrial freshwater and marine ecosystem as classified by IUCN. So you can see the entire landscape is really a protected area in one way or the other. Next, next slide. Besides all this diversity, we have people. This is an area with a large and growing human population. Some of the world's highest density of rural population are found here. You can see from the map, if it's large enough, uh, the biggest area that uh, contains population of one of 500 to 1,000 individuals per square kilometers, followed by 100 to 500. We also have populations in the black areas which are over 1,000 individuals per square kilometers. This means that this population puts a lot of pressure on these resources that I've mentioned. The, the population have to survive on the natural capital. And unfortunately, this is basically a rural population with high level of po uh, poverty. The forest products and other natural resources are key income sources supplemented from the income of small scale agriculture, fisheries and tourism has become increasingly important, but now completely affected by COVID-19. Human movement and migration is dynamic in this region as a result of uh, armed conflict that has been there for over 20 years and causing internal and transboundary displacement of people, which in turn impact on natural resources within the landscape. Next slide, please. Because of this mountainous and forest nature, uh, this region is a transboundary water tower for the entire region. It provides millions of people with fresh water for drinking and farming. And it's also well known for its highest and most permanent source of water for the River Nile. If you remember the historical, the, in the history, most of the explorers and the geographers were coming from all over the world 
to look for the source of the Nile, and they ended up in this region, and in particular, the Rwenzori area, where we have the glaciers. The freshwater lakes, that is Lake George and Lake Edward and Kivu and others, are two African most productive lakes and form important fisheries as well. It's also a home for approximately 80 endemic fish species that are found within these freshwater lakes, that is Lake George and Lake Edward. Next slide. Next slide, next slide. Despite this in importance, the GVL, that is the Greater Virunga landscape, faces a threat which put the species, the habitat connectivity, and the people at great risk. These include pressures for additional agricultural land and fresh water for the growing rural population in need of income and food. The impact of armed conflict that I mentioned in Eastern DRC has been very eminent and displacing thousands and thousands of uh, communities in other places, leading to unsustainable poaching, illegal trade in timber and wildlife products. And the pressure from extractive industry and associated uh, infrastructure development for extractive is also high. I'm going to illustrate this by giving you some figures. In as far as deforestation is concerned, we have an estimated 4,466 hectares of forest loss per year in this uh, landscape, representing a total emission of 1.2 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. This really undermines these three countries' contribution uh, uh, commitment to the Paris Agreement. The local, the, the forests are being degraded and leading to sedimentation of the lakes and the water causes, sources in the, in the greater Virunga. The local communities do fetch water from protected areas and this also ends up in the legal extraction of water resources and also the interface of those communities who enter the protected areas and the wildlife re relating to diseases that we are going to discuss today. The lakes that I mentioned before, which are very important, have a threat to pollution from extractives and overfishing. Poaching for subsistence and commercial purposes is a key challenge with a high porous border and the trafficking of wildlife is really, really a big problem uh, in this region. Trafficking of wildlife from DRC and from sometimes the Central African Republic, getting in through here, through Uganda and to the coastal area. In, 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 in East Africa. Next slide. The map we are seeing now illustrates an overlay of the mining and extractive industry pressure that exists on the landscape. If you can see the yellow, the slightly yellow things are blocks of areas that has, of concessions that have already been earmarked uh, for, for mining and extractives. The brown ones on the northern part are already given out. Those are concessions for oil and gas and exploration work and development is going on place. So this is really a big threat. Until recently, much of the artesian work uh, mining was through artesian processes, but now we have big companies from China and other places coming in and industrializing the mining sector. The recent oil and gas exploration and development and geothermal is a game changer, but it comes along with a lot of uh, environmental and social impacts that has got to be mitigated if we are going to maintain uh, the integrity of this, uh, uh, of this uh, landscape. Other potential concerns include mineral mining, hydropower dams, road development, tourism infrastructure development, all these overlaid on this will really certainly put a lot of pressure on these resources. Not to say, uh, I live alone, at country level, we have very poor uh, local level, uh, and local level we have poor level of planning and weak transboundary co cooperation that should really be putting this landscape as one piece. Next. Climate change is pretty, certainly a big threat to uh, the ecosystems and the people and the connectivity of this area. The, bio the biogeography of the 
the landscape render is vulnerable to climate change. Uh, on the background, you can see a mountain that should be Mohabura Mountain, which is at 4,500 meters above sea level. We have seen the movement of species, for example, the bamboo forest uh, on the, at heights of 2,000 meters above sea level are being invaded by broadleaf trees with their associated animals and, and, and fauna. So we, what will happen to the bamboo at the end of it? It will certainly get uh, disappear. It will certainly disappear with time. Increasing rainfall as predicted by the climate models is a big problem leading to a lot of floods, increasing temperatures and increasing frequency of fires are very common now. We have fires in Buindi, we have fires in Renzori five years ago. And you also know uh, of, of last week there was fires in, 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 the, in the Kilimanjaro mountain. That means these evergreen and moist ecosystems are becoming warmer and warmer. Next slide. Next slide. At the same time, the interface of the people and uh, wildlife is really, you know, put up a grave concern about the health of both wildlife and human beings. We have seen the zoonotic uh, spillover of events emerging from infectious disease. For example, in this particular area, we had Ebola, which is a very contagious and, uh, and with high mortality rate. Being here, we have the mulberry uh, fever, which developed in Queen Elizabeth and affected some tourists uh, two years ago. Uh, examples of other zoonotic diseases that relate to this are like the HIV, which have relationship with interface of animals and eating of uh, uh, eating of, uh, of bush meat. Next slide. While we have had all these challenges, uh, the both governments, agencies, and NGOs have been active in conservation and livelihood development for over 40 years in this region, as you will hear in the subsequent uh, presentation. This work has been outside protected areas as well as inside protected areas. The effort has achieved tremendous effort. For example, I already mentioned the increasing population of the mountain gorillas, uh, which, which is tremendous. We also have the governments of DRC, that is the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda and Rwanda, put platforms for strategic trans transboundary and collaborative management of natural resources in the greater Gorunga. These are translated into an intergovernmental uh, institution called the Greater Virunga Transboundary Co Collaboration, whose uh, objectives uh, is to facilitate collaboration on wildlife conservation, tourism development across border. And this was established through a treaty which was signed in 2015. So there's already an intergovernmental uh, organization that is in place working together with a array of different uh, organization to put in uh, uh, assisting. However, the pressure associated with tropical, with the triple challenge continue to increase and the zoonotic spill over events like COVID-19 would require us to develop a new alternative bold and innovative approaches. This is really why we are here today in this conference. Next slide. David, we're, we have to move on. So um, are you can we I'm, about, I'm, conc I'm concluding. Building on the success that have been achieved and the work working in close collaboration with the government and local communities, WWF is working to establish a coalition of interdisciplinary NGO working in the GVL. Uh, this would enable us to co-develop an overarching people-centered co uh, strategy with a shared vision for conservation and sustainable development that strengthen existing mechan mechanism for strategic transboundary and collaborative management through government, uh, non-government and private sector partnership. This, inter this interdisciplinary nature of this coalition is important in the way that we have a genuine commitment that is already coming on board. Co-development and inclusivity is going to be critical addressing the triple challenge, integrating one health approach, and ultimately enabling impact with, uh, within the Greater Virunga at a much bigger scale and more systemic level. 
Thank you very much. It's the end of my presentation. Thank you, David. Um, that was a shocker of a photo to see that silverback out in the in the middle of the fields. I mean, space is limited. You're, it was a fantastic uh, overview presentation of the landscape. And as you can see, it's all about space here. Safe operating space for people, safe operating space for nature, and that space is being squeezed by climate change. So David, thank you so much for, for giving us an insight. And now we'd like to have it a go deeper and, and have more perspectives on, on this landscape and this issue. And we're gonna have four panelists. Now we are struggling um, with some technical diff difficulties getting one of the panelists, but the four we have right now um, are Ruth uh, Mwizire, uh, an environmental scientist and youth activist, uh, Annabem uh, Masozera, who is the director of the International Gorilla Conservation Program, uh, Beatrice uh, Kabahoga, who is the founder of Uplift the Rural Poor in the region. And then hopefully if, if it works out uh, with the, our, our technical systems, uh, uh, Chantal Shalukoma, who is the deputy director of the Virunga National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo and working for the Democratic Republic of Congo government. So here's what we're going to do. We're gonna have this uh, panel discussion where we're gonna ask the panelists to actually say more about themselves uh, than my one word uh, introduction here, just a little bit more. And then we're gonna have them each answer a uh, one moderated question each to get this going um, and, 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 and ask that those responses are a few minutes. And then we're gonna open it up to a moderated dialogue until the end of our allotted session time. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll finish leaving a few minutes uh, for Will to come back because we're going to create closed circle on this conversation and provide some wrap up thoughts. Um, in the meantime, uh, we'd like you, the, everyone to submit questions and answers. As this discussion co continues, we'd like everyone to um, provide uh, um, questions and answers in the, in the Whova uh, uh, question and answer box. So I will take those questions and then uh, ask the audience to, I'm uh, sorry, ask the panelists to um, answer them. So um, at first I'd like to ask uh, Ruth uh, if uh, a question, and Ruth, are you are you ready to go? I see, I'm not sure if you're- uh, Yes, I am. Okay, good. Hi, Ruth, how are you? W Ruth, where are you calling in from? Hello, from Kampala. Oh, fantastic. So Ruth, in your personal experience, how do you see uh, this chip, triple challenge manifesting in the greater Virunga landscape from your perspective? Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, my name is Ruth Mwizere. I am an environmental scientist and activist and a native of the Virunga landscape. Um, I'm also a programs officer at InfoNile, which is a project of Water Journalists Africa. Um, in my work as an environmental activist, I have been in many communities um, teaching about agroforestry and so many issues around the environment. And I think um, there's never been a better time than now to discuss this triple challenge. Uh, like David said earlier, um, for example, in Uganda, we have 75% of our population under the age of 30. And we also have one of the highest fertility rates in the world. So that means at the rate at which we are going, in about 50 years, we shall be more than double the number that we are now. So I appreciate that we're having this conversation to think about how we are going to feed this population without um, compromising the sustainability of our natural resources. Um, in the communities I've interacted with, um, one of the problems I have encountered has been the fact that most people live below the poverty line. And because of that, they are, um, they look at loss of biodiversity or uh, climate change as a far off um, impact. They are faced with a greater direct uh, threat where their attention is. So one of the issues that we are going to have to address as we look at this challenge is how to get people to, to value biodiversity enough 
to look at it as something they can protect, regardless of whatever is happening around, regardless of the fact that the population is going to double. So how will we have this population to look and value um, by bi the biodiversity around them? Um, this problem might not be um, local to the greater uh, the Virunga landscape. Um, most people look at conservation as an anti-development move, especially if they're not getting a direct value, a direct monetary value from the given resource. And the opposite is true. When people are getting a direct value from biodiversity, they are encouraged to conserve it. Uh, taking an example at the gorillas, we, we've seen the community, the local community, get so much employment, infrastructure development because of the gorillas. And because of that, uh, it has contributed to how much success we have seen in the story of the, of the, of the mountain gorillas. So to respond to this challenge, it will be necessary to make sure people, both the ones we have right now and the upcoming population, but it's going to be much more than us, care about biodiversity and have to protect it. So we need to, to harness the power of the young people, the population that we have right now, um, to hold their leaders accountable. Because making policies is one thing, especially in Africa, and implementing those policies is, is another. But when you have a population that understands um, the impact of this challenge and are able to hold the leaders accountable, then we can be able to to achieve it. So um, I think the main challenge as we, as we address this challenge is how to get the population to care enough to make a change, to care enough to, to hold the leaders accountable regardless of the situation that is going to change, because the situation definitely will change. But how shall we feed the, how can, shall we get people to feed their children without um, caring less about biodiversity? So um, the challenge is not only in in the in the increasing population, but how we shall change the mindset of this population. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Risa. And uh, um, I'm I'm showing my age because when I first went to uh, Uganda in 1981, we only had one stoplight that didn't work at the bank of. Uh, Olivia uh, Crossroads, and that was where Entebbe Road and Kampala Road came together. Now to think about how much the population's grown and the changes in the country, it's staggering. And you, you, you pinpoint um, exactly um, one of the key issues. I'd like to turn it to, to Anna uh, to, at, uh, to answer this question. Um, what institutional arrangements could uh, best enable a integrated or joined up approach uh, to the triple challenge in the greater Virunga landscape. Anna? Thank you, Gary, and uh, thank you for um, the invitation to participate in such an exciting conversation. Um, hey, Anna, can you raise your volume on your, on your um, and I'm not sure if I'm the only one who hears you in a low volume, sorry. I think this might help. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, so again, really thrilled to be here. I'm joining from Kigali in Rwanda. Um, and as was mentioned by, by David Dooley, we, we have a lot to work with in this landscape as it, as it relates to institutional frameworks um, and as, as it relates to transboundary policy forums. So we can take a look at this long history um, as inspiration to tackling the triple challenge. Uh, in the early days, transboundary collaboration was championed and led by conservation civil society organizations, Albertine Rift Conservation Society, Wildlife Conservation Society, and the coalition program I now lead, um, the International Gorilla Conservation Program. But over time, and it did take quite a bit of time, a more complex politically led framework was established focused on wildlife conservation and tourism development. And that framework is the intergovernmental Greater Runga Transboundary Collaboration that David mentioned. So one, one important thing to note, um, while largely born on the promise and delivery of mountain gorilla tourism as a source of foreign income and a driver for economic growth, political will was also built through thoughtful leadership at all levels, uh, a sense of shared responsibility uh, to the mountain gorilla as central to local, national, and regional identity. 
And I think some of these factors of what motivated um, the transboundary uh, institutions we have in place is, is of critical importance um, as we think of, of a more interdisciplinary um, framework for tackling the triple challenge and specific issues related to, to human health, one health approaches. Um, in the end, for mountain gorillas, this integrated collaborative approach, which addressed political, economic, and social dimensions at site and transboundary level, has contributed to a rare and fragile success story, as indicated recently in the improved status of the mountain gorillas as a subspecies. And 30 or 40 years ago, that was not um, believed to be a reality that we would be in um, today. Um, so that's an incredible you know, challenge overcome um, in difficult circumstances. So a few more reflections on addressing the triple challenge, um, especially as it relates to matching practicalities with aspirations. Um, I thought it was really interesting to look at the, the navigated trade-offs um, structure that, that Will presented earlier, because we can see that playing out as well, because collaboration is built on trust, which is achieved through dialogue and having clear shared objectives. Uh, it does take negotiation um, and it takes humility and empathy as human beings working in this space. Um, and it takes valuing achievement over attribution, uh, which needs to be a shared mantra. And it takes leaders and champions in all roles and capacities. Um, it has to be formal, but also firmly built on the informal. The personal connection is essential to overcoming challenges together. Um, in our experience. And I've been with IGCP for, for 10 years and have seen that um, ring true. It's also important to build on existing structures and networks. So a movement approach can be created in which human, social, political, and financial capital is leveraged for a common goal. One thing to, to be aware of, identifying and addressing spoilers early is important. And I'll give you one example, such as corruption, um, so that shared clear objectives can be achieved. Good governance, of course, is critical as the enabling environment for an integrated and collaborative approach to take root and bear fruit. And that speaks to some of Ruth's comments as well. Now more than ever, human health is at the nexus of, of addressing the triple challenge. Um, David touched on some of the you know, human health uh, challenges in the region, and I'll add measles and Ebola and coronavirus to, to that list. Um, and all of which have been a direct threat to human life and ambitions in this landscape. Uh, through the current efforts of the Greater Virunga Transboundary Collaboration, a regional contingency plan for COVID-19 has been developed with a focus on the mountain gorilla parks. We are learning important lessons um, as it relates to One Health. Um, in both this effort, small successes and the barriers to its full uptake, which can help us more effectively address these challenges from a One Health perspective going forward. One is information flow and communication is critical. We need to embrace new ways of doing this and invest more strategically, um, especially in the human resources to drive these functions in order to optimize their value toward objectives. Two is that we need to challenge our assumptions frequently and robustly and be ready and willing to do that. So that way a course correction can be identified and taken early on. Um, further, you know, a critical assumption is that our interests are shared and interconnected, um, but we routinely fail to, to really take the time to assess and articulate these in meaningful and, and sufficient ways. So in short, mountain gorilla conservation is a success story, but it in isolation is not a long-term solution. If we don't address the triple challenges in the broader landscape through building and establishing more interdisciplinary institutions and robust collaborations meant to last, we cannot sustain this fragile success for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, Beatrice, um, are you there? And I'd like to yes. talk to Beatrice, nice to see you. <laughs> Um, yeah. And I understand your video is perhaps not working, so uh, 
Beatrice, we, we, we totally understand. But uh, Beatrice, um, well, I'd like to ask you a question and uh, is what synergies and trade-offs can you see most clearly in your work between food and agriculture needs and biodiversity conservation approach? And how can these be best managed um, from your point of view? So thank you. Um, and, and, and if you need any, any help from us to, um, with this technical work, we'll, we'll try to do our best, but thank you for, for chiming in. And Beatrice, you're calling in from where? Yeah, this is Beatrice. I'm calling in from Uganda. Perfect. First southwestern Uganda, around Ugindi and the Chia Forest. Yeah, I'm Beatrice once again. And uh, my question going like, what synergies and trade-offs can you see most like clearly in the in your work between food agriculture needs and biodiversity conservation approach in the, in the GVL? And how can it be best managed from my point of view? Yeah, first of all, uh, I brief the rural poor, I take the background as a community-based organization that has, is, uh, that has been in place to improve livelihoods of communities, and also reduce pressure on the natural resources. Apparently, under the Buddha Reef Country Office Uganda, we are the hub and we are supporting communities, uh, activities that include community conservation, mitigation of human wildlife conflict, reformed poachers, promoting community tourism, um, forest landscape restoration, livelihood improvement, and also implementing the UWA policy the integration of sexual productive rights to empower women and youth, and climate change adaptation, and water resource management. Uh, for the trade-offs that I'm seeing in the Great Virunga, there is uh, there is effect of high population densities, and the population is growing too big, and you realize that uh, we are between up to 500 to 1,000 persons per kilometer. And there is visible intensification of land of, of, of agriculture around the PS, and sometimes no buffer zone are seen, and no more forest and private lands on private lands. And this was also seen when David was presenting the intensification of agriculture. Then in the in the in the landscape, there is also high level of unemployment rates among the youth, and realize that uh, youth make almost over 70 percent of the population within the landscape. And more than over 90% are unemployed, illiterate, and some level they are always first forced into early marriages. And what else? They resort to poaching for survival. There is also climate change that often is manifesting as prolonged droughts and fraud and, and floods. This has affected also uh, food production and agriculture, and it is also causing serious food insecurity and the most affected in this area are the youth women and we have what we call the indigenous people the batwa who are typically forest dependents and this has also accelerated encroachment on forest and water resources for better agriculture conditions you find people encroaching even in swamp in the wetlands they saw also increased human wildlife conflicts within the area from the protected area, uh, where wildlife from the protected areas destroy uh, community gardens and causing a lot of food loss. And also now what people do, they revenge on the wildlife. Um, and when I go for the synergies in food, agriculture and biodiversity conservation, I think we, uh, we have to adopt intensive agriculture on high viral crops like vegetables, using la less land and produce more to, more to reduce rates of habitat loss and encroachment on water resources. Then we are looking at strengthening partnerships with organizations most involved with women and youth to empower them to match the population with the resources scale up agriculture certification schemes to reduce negative impacts on food production of nature. That is, we think that if people get certifications or agencies, depending on producing food that is not hazard to environment or to nature, then we'll be uh, creating some synergies of, of protecting our nature and also producing food. 
We have penetration. Uh, also, if we look at penetrate the procurement entities and costume, costumers to de demand food that has no diverse effects on nature, like also maybe going agro, agro uh, organic farming, so that that one catches, uh, fetches more money. And I think also it would work for us. Then there is support non consumer con uh, uh, like non conservative approaches such as tourism, of which it increases food markets demand in conservation areas. That then it would be motivating communities adjacent to the park, to the PAs, farming food towards markets and agro tourism as alternative enterprises. And for us as URP, what we've been doing, we've been promoting safe water access through household and community renewable water vesting thanks for the for domestic use, engaging women and youth in nature-based enterprises like handcrafts and community tourism, backyard gardening and ash potatoes for food security, working with reformed poachers, indigenous forest pocket owners, community tourism association and timber dealers, have other livelihood options like animal rearing, beekeeping, equipping them with skills for problem animal crop raiding outside the park, then tree planting to keep full supply timber into the business without harm of the PS. And also we are partnering with Reproductive Health in Uganda in promoting sexual rights in the VGL to mitigate the pressure. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. And thank you for, um, you know, uh, overcoming some of the connectivity options we have just getting your, your voice into the community today. Um, thank you, Beatrice. Um, I don't thank believe you. we have Chantal uh, as part of our uh, panel discussion. I, I do want to say that it's indicative. I just want to speak on behalf of Chantal Shalukoma, who's Deputy Director of, of Runga National Park. I think it's indicative of the challenges that the people who work in Burunga National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo face daily, not only just being able to talk about what they do and their security that they face every day that they go to work in one of the, in the world's, one of the world's greatest national parks. If you've never been there, you should read stories about Burunga. You should watch the movie Burunga. It is an, an incredible area of the world. I think you know folks like Chantal have to be applauded. They are the vanguard for conservation in that part of the world, dealing with the triple challenge every day with their life on the line. So I apologize for Chantal not being here, but I don't want to you know I don't want to miss this moment in in in, in not recognizing because she should be recognized and all her colleagues should be for the incredible work that they do in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So that much said, we're gonna open it up now uh, for open, open questions. And we've been getting some questions in the question and answer uh, box. So um, I will uh, put these to our three panelists. Uh, uh, and David, um, and uh, you do not have to um, uh, be anonymous here. Uh, in having set this stage up, you're welcome to join in on, the, on answering the questions too. So the first question I'd like to point out it's because we were going to ask uh, Chantal uh, about the uh, um, the Ebola outbreak in Benny. You may have heard of this. I mean, they you know they face a lot of things, and they're facing Ebola as well in Eastern DRC. But in this presentation, you know, Will did begin with and saying that COVID nineteen um, might have might be a trigger for policymakers to do a better uh, job of integrating their actions. And, and what do you guys think about this from your perspective? How is COVID-19 or these other, you know, major spillover events like Ebola, you know, changing mindsets or policies or practices where you are? And um, I, I, let me call on, let, look, Anna, can you start with that one? Yeah, no, thank you. And I think, um, you know, not being from this region, I think it's important to, you know, put different lenses um, of perspective on this. So I think just to note that in this region, there's already a lot of discussion and dialogue moving in this direction. There was already this recognition um, that, you know, the, the climate is changing. 
um, it is impacting people's lives directly on a day-to-day -day basis. So just to say that, you know, there's a lot of really um, exciting policy um, elements that could be looked at from this region um, for inspiration elsewhere, um, which is quite different from the European and you know, Western uh, perceptions about um, these issues. So I just wanted to add that um, before maybe another colleague joins in. Beatrice or uh, Ruth? Hello. Yes, Ruth. Um, I, will, I, will, I think COVID-19 has brought so many issues and one of them being um, putting a halt to tourism. Um, I think more than ever, people have seen the, the value of the things they've taken for granted for so long. Uh, so personally, I've, I've interacted with people who have been tour guides who have been in the community where business was booming when tourism was, was open. But because of, of, of COVID-19, when tourism closed, people saw what could happen if actually tourism stopped. So much as it is something bad, I think uh, part of the population has seen the value of, um, of biodiversity, of the mountain gorilla. I'm talking about the mountain gorilla because the people I have interacted with, the people from Kisoro who have been whose businesses have been depending on tourism. So um, in some way, people have woken up to see that actually the things they have taken for granted for so long are things that have been sustained them. David, did you want to add? I see you. Yes. Um, you know, COVID-19 has really opened the eyes of uh, the public and also of governments and a number of institutions and partners about the link between um, environmental degradation and evolution of some diseases that uh, originally or initially were not known to be uh, diseases that affect people. So the link between the degradation of environment and the frequency at which these diseases are now coming on and affecting our population in Africa and other parts of the world now is beginning to shed a, a new approach on looking at environment as an asset that is important for the health of the community and that has got to be preserved. And as a result, we find ourselves now beginning to work with partners that initially we were not thinking of ever working with. Uh, the health institutions are now coming on board. We are now getting to the fabrics of the community by using churches, and having memorandum of understanding with the church leaders to put in their, their, their summons and preaching uh, the issue of the environment that initially we were just focusing with our like-minded organization. It has opened our eyes that you cannot achieve much until when you get into the population with this correct information and, 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 and let people know and change behavior, change practice and begin to respect the environment from a different angle. Uh, for the purpose of life, for provision of food, provision of health, provision of water, uh, and even our campaigns on plastics, uh, which initially was not being taken up very seriously. Now we talk about it and, and relate it to what it may affect the health and make weaken up the body immunity and expose you to some of these zoonotic diseases at a different scale. So even we are looking at um, changing the way we, we do our budgetings and, and, and do our work out. Uh, for example, the type of meeting that we are having now, it's now being rolled and it's a common way of working now rather than having you know, spent a lot of money on transportation, on, on, on staying in hotels or for big workshops. So all these are really now beginning to even challenge, uh, channel our thinking to a different level of how to do things better uh, with, with better efficiency and effectiveness uh, without necessarily endangering uh, the population. That's what I can add on, getting better ways of doing things and also aware that COVID-19 is certainly not going to disappear. It's gonna be with us just as, uh, like other diseases 
in time to come. So we need to adapt. And the importance of nature and the saying that, you know, nature can do without you, but you cannot do without nature is now really something that everybody understands. Over. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Beatrice, um, I mean, yes. often, you know, with these epidemics and pandemics, the poor are, are, are the ones who are most disadvantaged and disproportionately feel the, the pain of these things. Is this what you're seeing? Yeah. Uh, hello? Are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Just speak hello? a little louder. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, also where I'm working now, uh, we have seen the effects and we are looking at, we are seeing people changing attitudes and uh, majorly people around Binda and Gahinga, we are sorry depending on tourism and now we are seeing them shifting to agriculture because they are finding that that's where their source of livelihood is. And also we are see, uh, also that the way we used to do things, like going to the community and you gather so many people, now we are opting to use radio programs to reach out to the communities. And also when you go there, it is targeting a few, but also you find that the communication is effective because it is taking people to, they are, they are presenting others. But what is the most uh, interesting, I saw people shifting to agriculture for the livelihood improvement. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Beat. So I got, um, before I answer, ask the next question, I did get a, a message from Chantal, who just asked us to consider this and, you know, protected, she's a protected area manager. You know, it's, it's one thing that they're dealing, you know, Barunga's dealing with Ebola, now they're dealing with COVID-19, you know, it's crisis management, it's, you know, protected area managers aren't trained in epidemiology, and yet they are the recipient or the downstream um, uh, feeler of the pain, you know, whether it's lack of tourism or loss of park staff or the local communities are affected. They're at the front line. They're not trained in health, but they have to work with the Ministry of Health to do this. So, you know, she, uh, her, her point is, is that, you know, it is a one health moment now. You know, we cannot separate these sectors anymore. Uh, conservation is linked to health, is linked to agriculture, and, and protected areas are not just about saving nature. They're an integrated part of the way we live on this planet. So thanks, uh, Chantal, for, for sending that in. Our, our next question is, um, how has political instability, I mean, this all leads to, you know, it's, it's one thing after another. How has political instability affected the transnational cooperation in the greater Virunga landscape? And how do conservationists in this area juggle the responsibilities of the park and, and human population? So it's, it's a bit of a follow on from what Chantal, Chantal has said. Anyone like to answer that? Anna, I see, you're, I see you've come on. Yeah, I, I beat the rest of the panelists to it. Um, so I think in terms of the broad political context we're dealing with, there are certainly impacts. Um, and we see that happening in terms of uh, information flow uh, or lack thereof. Um, and, you know, just something else that is not specifically related to political context, but something we're all dealing with as well is the, you know, the, the need for really credible sources of information, um, especially when we're we're looking at you know, scientific information on which decisions can, can be taken. Um, so it undermines the, you know, the, the bedrock of trust and the information flow. And, and this is why you know, the, the relationships that are developed, um, you know, the, the technical collaboration can continue and continue to you know, um, uh, support uh, collaborative actions um, in these contexts because they've been built and maintained over time. And as much as a politically led process is really important, it speaks to the role of civil society as well um, to, to, to backstop um, and again to be, you know, a, a credible partner to um, collaborative action across borders. 
Ruth, Beatrice, David, any response? Yes, um, thanks, Gary. I think political instability is not a recipe that anybody would like to see in an environment across the, the globe. But uh, there it is, it's always there. Um, political instability really leads to institutional collapse. And once institutions do collapse, there's no way you're going to have a dialogue across boundaries. If just one part of uh, the consortium or the countries in which uh, we are working in, like for the Greater Virunga, one of the three countries has a problem of political insecurity in one part of the clan, uh, it leads to institutional collapse in that place. And that also affects the way other institutions in the surrounding countries would work to address the transboundary and, uh, issues. So uh, once the institutions do collapse, uh, it's not left in a vacuum. Some kind of uh, fill up is done through an informal arrangement. And this informal arrangement can be out of uh, the faction of those political impact of those political uh, instability. For example, in some parts uh, of the Eastern DRC, we had warlords who were in really good control of part of the protected areas, and they were the ones giving out uh, licenses uh, for, 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 for timber cutting, for example, illegal timber patrick cutting, uh, wildlife trafficking. So it, I mean, uh, if such a thing is happening at a transboundary level, there's no way uh, the other uh, surrounding countries can be at peace. The governance issue, I think, is also what I'm touching on. Governance will certainly disappear, and things will be taken in the hands. The wildlife are the first targets to suffer, uh, because then it's an easy target in terms of food, uh, in terms of economic development, econo economic uh, benefits, which is illegal. The wildlife traffickers from other countries or from other parts of the world will come in and they will be very difficult. It would be very difficult to control uh, this. And of course, uh, communication and information flow that Anna has said is very important. There is no way you can manage an inter-country inter, uh, uh, inter uh, collaboration without sharing of com information and, and, com and good communication. Loss of life is really quite a critical thing. We've seen the control of zoonotic diseases become very, very difficult. Uh, we have heard of situations where during the Ebola case, some of the centers are really being invaded and uh, the myth created that this, this is a disease that it doesn't exist. It is just a, you know, a propaganda to, to, to control us. And the, I mean, they go to the centers and the patients are all distributed, uh, you know, I, some of them killed, the medical people killed, the volunteers killed. And this, this kind of thing is, doesn't, doesn't work and doesn't bring any development, doesn't, doesn't bring any, 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 any institutional collaboration between the different frontiers or in, in the transboundary arrangement. Oh, of course, the economic factors is, is, is there for the poor, the poor one. Uh, they have to leave their places, they have to move to places of safety, and they have to transport these problems to other places, and you need really resources to cater for that, uh, internal displacement. And of course, we now see, even at international level, some of this political instability leading to mass migration to countries which otherwise would not have faced this kind of impact. They are facing it. We had our budgets the last year cut by 25% from our donors, because they have really to cater for the immigrants which are moving from different parts of the world and affecting their own budget. So it's, it's not something desirable, it's something that affects uh, health, affects food production, affects all sorts of ways of living which is not desirable, over. Thank you, David. I mean, look, I mean, if uh, these are really, <laughs> this is very serious business here. Ruth, I mean, with 70% and, and Beatrice, with 70% of Uganda's and the region's uh, population, you know, youthful, I mean, youth needs hope. Where's the hope, you know, how do we instill hope, you know, with our young people given these really stark challenges? Ruth? Yeah. Um, I think um, the young people can be given hope 
uh, given these challenges by um, encouraging them to interact more with nature. Because um, Hello? Yeah, you're there, Ruth. You're you're Hello? there. Yeah, yeah, you're uh, yeah. Um the young people uh, could hope from, from interaction what is lacking is is the action. I think hope is all around us. When you when you look at the little success stories, they give us hope. Looking at the recent baby boom for gorillas in, in, in Uganda, that is enough hope to know that actually when we put action towards something, we can achieve it. So I think hope is there. We just need to hold on to it and get into action. Thank you. So, Beatrice? I think hope is there. Yeah. Beatrice, I'm going to ask you the, the last question here. Uh, is that could yes. you speak a bit? Could you speak a bit um, to how traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge is uh, can be an advantage uh, with addressing some of these triple uh, challenge issues that we've brought up? Yeah, I think uh, we can build on the indigenous knowledge uh, to look at how people uh, used to to to, to live. Uh, we start from how they are, and also we build from what they know and what they do to, to drive to other interventions. Like, for example, if we want, like, if we could go for, like, skilling the youth, we look at, like, at uh, the, 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 their innovations, their indigenous innovations, what they used to do, and how best can it be improved to, 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 to touch on the market. And also when we look at the indigenous knowledge on, on, the, on, on, the, on the medicinal plants, we build from what people know so that we can improve what they know to get the desired uh, market trends that are going on. That's great. Um, so let me just step back here before you know, ending. Um, oh, oh, Ruth, please, please, Ruth, I forgot. Can you, could you comment too about indigenous knowledge, please? Uh, yes, thank you. I think um, one of the, of the things we need really to put at the forefront is indigenous knowledge. However, the challenge is that most of the indigenous knowledge is not documented. So documented by indeed, documenting this knowledge would be a huge step towards using it to, to achieve this goal. We, I, the problem is that most of the people that have this knowledge are maybe illiterate or are unable to pass it on in the modern way of writing. However, I think the media should take it upon themselves to make documentaries out of this, to make sure that this information is passed on to the next generation. I'd like to uh, take this moment now to thank our panelists and, and, and thank you from everyone who is part of our audience on behalf of our audience and those outside who recognize the work that you do every day for people, for biodiversity, for these land, for this landscape in this incredibly, you know, challenging part of the world. And you continue it with resolve, with hope, and 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 you do you do it without any thanks. But from all of us, we thank you on this. So I'm going to turn this back to Will um, to summarize and, and bring us home, if you will, is that we've seen triple challenge from the integrated policy approach. We've heard about triple challenge from practitioners on the ground. Um, you all said about this has to be integrated. We have to have this conversation. Anna brought up about trust. I hope everyone who listened today is trust, trust this community of people who are doing this work and put your trust into this landscape. So Will, I'll, I'll ask you now to, to wrap us up. Hi, um, Gary, and thanks everyone. What, what a rich discussion we've had. Um, and uh, just a, such a shame that we couldn't have Chantal on the line in person. I have taken 
10 main points for our conversation, which will be insufficient to, to convey its richness, but I'll go through them really quickly. Um, but I, what I will say is I obviously haven't captured all the key learning points here. And up on, on the screen now, you'll see um, our Slido QR code again. And we'd love you to go into Slido and share your, we have one last question for you, which is about sharing your key learning points from the session, which would be great to hear and for us to take away. Um, so please do that. Um, the, the key point I think that, that, we, that I would start with is, is we heard how the Great Virunga landscape exemplifies the triple challenge and the One Health um, challenge. And at the same time, so in, in terms of the challenges in that landscape, but at the same time, it also has many lessons to learn um, to the rest of the world because they have had to deal in that landscape, the, the, the people and organizations there have had to deal with this kind of integrated challenge for some time. Um, and so there are lessons we can learn from that. So with that in mind, I think the, the, the series of things I've taken is, um, firstly, we've got to keep in mind the very real needs of many of our global community. There's still very high levels of poverty around the world. The second is, is the need to um, value biodiversity and also to make that value real to those who, um, who are engaging with biodiversity on a day-to-day -day level. And this can help that group of people also to hold government to account. We heard how collaboration was, was really important in, in tackling the Ebola um, outbreak recently in DRC. And we also heard how collaboration needs to be built on trust and that, that takes dialogue. Um, and it might also mean that we need to value achievement over attribution and be building formal collaboration, but with um, a basis of informal uh, connections. And we heard how the young population will be pivotal in this. It's such a huge part of our global population and indeed the population in the greater Fringle landscape. They need to be given voice, they need to be given an opportunity to engage with nature. And of course, they are seeking employment and good employment at that. We, we talked about a balance of high productive agriculture with more conservation-based agriculture and the role that public procurement could play in, in, in supporting good production approaches. We heard how COVID-19 has been a real wake-up call um, both on the value of nature um, and also um, we need to bear in mind that COVID-19 is not going anywhere fast and its impact on the tourism industry has been significant. Um, and we, we also heard the, about the importance of stable and effective institutions in delivering um, on the, the triple challenge um, in the long term. And you know, this is real. We're talking about loss of life in a landscape like the Greater Vinca landscape and, and others, both from infectious diseases, but also conflict. And so the, the stakes are very high and the urgency is, is also very high. And lastly, two points I would make is, is one, the, we, we talked about the value of building on indigenous knowledge and talked about the role the media can play in documenting that so we don't lose that in future um, and it's passed on through generations. And then, and then I think the thing to recognize at the end there, as you said, Gary, is the importance of every individual being supported through their own resilience. It's gonna, it, these are not difficult problems, not easy problems to overcome, and it requires a great deal of personal resilience and institutional resilience to find a way through in, in the long term. Um, but as I say, I, I won't have covered everything. I'd love to see what insights um, the audience have taken, and I hope they'll be putting those in on, on Slido now. So I'll hand back over to you, Gary. Thank you, Will. On behalf of Will um, and everyone who gave presentations and, and panelists, my esteemed colleagues, thank you for sharing your thoughts, your ideas. Um, you're sharing your homes, sharing this landscape with everyone here, sharing the challenges you face every day. And, and I hope that you all in your hearts, you know, Think of the greater Virunga landscape as a landscape that you want to help and support and, 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 and support these great activities on the ground. Um, we are one global community. It's an all hands on deck moment. We have to work together. It is about trust. But as we all know right now, you know, tr trust is a rare and fragile entity in our world now. And we have to work to maintain it, support it, and that's what conservation is about, is about us working together in trusting ways for a better planet. So thank you, go forth. And we're grateful for your participation and time in listening to everything that we spoke about from the triple challenge to the one health solution in the greater Virungo landscape. Bye-bye.